good evening. <clears throat> I want to welcome you uh, to the community revival service tonight. And uh, I want to take a moment and thank Brother Bob Cox and uh, him being obedient to the Lord. And I'm really encouraged to see and excited where this is going to go in the next days, weeks, and even month ahead and what God is going to do through it. Uh, but I want to ask you, if you will, my name is Joey McCride, and I'm the pastor at Sardis Free Baptist Church in Eufaula, Alabama. And I'm going to ask you, if you would, go ahead and take the Word of God and go with me, if you don't mind, to Joshua chapter number 7. Joshua chapter number 7. And when I uh, begin to think about and pray about, Lord, what do you want me to say tonight? Uh, God began to deal with me and talk to me in my heart a little bit about my own life and what he's doing in my life and what I feel like he's doing in our church and uh, and also what I feel like he's doing in our community here in Eufaula, Alabama. And we thank him for being such a good God to us and uh, for working with us. And, you know, I hear so much about what's going on. But I think the Lord is more into this than what we're giving him credit for and how he's using it in our lives. And so with that being said, I'm going to ask you, if you will, to take your Bible and go with me uh, to Joshua chapter number 7. And I want us to look, if we can, begin reading in verse number 1 together with me, if you would. And the Bible says this, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. So now it tells us, they're sinning after their big victory of Jericho in chapter 6. But look at verse 2, what the Bible says. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Aven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. So he sent them to this small town right outside of Bethel called Ai. And this is the second city uh, that we know in the Canaan land that God's people came to, the one that uh, God had promised to Abraham that would be theirs uh, there in the beginning in Genesis 12, I think it is off the top of my head. But, but look what happens in verse number 3. And the Bible says, and they returned to Joshua. So God's people came back to Joshua, their leader, and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but, less, uh, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. And then look at verse 4. So there went up thither about three thousand people, and they fled before the men of Ai. And now watch what happens. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate, even unto Sherebim, uh, Shebarim, I'm sorry, and smote them in the going down wherever the hearts of the people melted and became as water. So they went up to Ai, and what happened? They were blown away. They began to get beat. They were being defeated. And 36 men uh, began to, to lose their life. And what happens? Verse number 6, the Bible says, And Joshua rent his clothes, fell on the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord unto the eventide, he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou brought all this people over Jordan to deliver us in the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we have been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan, O Lord. What shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land... Uh, shall hear of it and shall environ around us around and cut off our name from the earth. And what will thou do unto thy great name? So Joshua and his men, they get on their face for God. God, what are you going to do? And now look what God does in verse number 10, and we're almost there. The Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou upon thy face? Israel hath Sin. You read that right. Let's read it again. Verse 11. Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed against my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have taken of the accursed thing, and have stolen, disassembled also. They have put it even among their own stuff. Uh, and so I want to hear just for a little bit tonight. I want to preach on this idea of waking up the church, waking up the church. Would you bow your heads together with me in a word of prayer in the Bible? Um, let's go to the Lord after the reading of the Bible, His Word. Father, we thank you for loving us right now. And God, I thank you for the next few moments. And I ask you that you will bless your word in our hearts and lives and you'll use it in my life, Lord, and in the life of my family, Lord, and our church family here at Sardis, but all the believers, God, in our community that are part of of this online revival. And Lord, I thank you, Brother Bob, and I pray you be with him and his wife and his precious kids. And Lord, would you bless them and keep them in your hand and care and protect them. And 
And Lord, we pray now in the next few moments, you would guide us, lead us, Jesus. Use your word now in our hearts. We pray in your name. And all God's people say it, amen and amen. Now watch this. I want you to envision with me just for a little bit that there was a man and he's driving in his car and his wife's in the passenger seat and they're going down the road and they've been on a journey for a while now. And after they've been on the road for several hours, they've only stopped a couple times, the man begins to get weary. Uh, the man begins to doze off and here and there and his eyes are getting hard to stay open and, and he kind of dozes off and as he does, his wife notices it and she reaches over and she wakes him up and shakes him and wakes him up and yells at him and, and he realizes what he's doing and he steers the car back on track and he continues on his journey and, uh, and, and what would have happened if that man's wife would not have shooken him, shaken him and woke him up? Well, I believe tonight that this is what we're seeing out of the Church of the Living God uh, with this thing of coronavirus. I believe the church, and I think you would agree with me, has fallen asleep on our journey uh, that God has placed us on, and God has used something like this to wake us up. However, tonight, I want to say this, that while God may have our attention tonight, please follow me. He may have our attention tonight. I believe that God wants to get us back on track. He wants to get us going down the road of the journey he's placed us on. But my friend, we can have revival, but are we willing to pay the price? Now, that's the question that we all got to answer tonight. Am I willing to pay the price? Is my family willing to pay the price to have revival? Is our church here where I pastor, is it willing to have, to pay the price to have revival? Uh, the church where Brother Bob pastors, uh, the church where other pastors have been on this online revival, are we willing to pay the price to see revival from God? God's got our attention. He's shaken us. He's woken us up. But are we willing to pay that price? And my friend, I think that is something that we've got to ask ourselves. Are we willing to pay that price? Now, follow me right here. And the Bible says in our text this evening that God had to wake up his people. He had to get their attention. And after he got their attention, he told them, if you want revival, then you've got to deal with the sin. If you want revival, then you have got to deal with sin. God's people had led uh, to a big victory in Jericho in chapter number 6. They moved on and, and then, then they didn't. They were warned, don't you take of the accursed thing while they were there in Jericho. And you know the story or you may not. After they were leaving Jericho in chapter 6, there was this man that took of the accursed thing and he sinned against God. And God comes to him and, and, and then they go to this little battle in Ai. And as they go to Ai in chapter 7, they begin to lose. They begin to, beat, to get beat and they were defeated. And they come to God and say, God, will you help us, Lord? God woke them up. He got their attention. And God said, yes, I will. But you have got to deal with the sin of Achan. you got to deal with the sin of Achan. And so what had happened there is God led his people. He woke them up. But then he said, if you want revival, my friend... You have got to deal with the sin that has caused this defeat in your life and in, and in the lives of others. And my friend, I want to say to you tonight that we cannot respect revival if we do not deal with sin. Let me say this. This is not popular in our world right now. And the church has woke up. We've realized that God has shaken us at our core and, and, and we are not doing all that God wants us to do and, and we want to see God move. But I want to say this. We're not going to see God move, my friend, until we deal with the sin in our lives personally, in our families, in our homes, in our churches, and in our community as believers. We have got to deal with sin. And I want to say tonight that dealing with sin is a painful thing. It is a very painful thing to deal with sin. Achan's family would die from this. You think about that. They would die from this. Dealing with sin in my life and in your life, it is a very painful thing to sit down and deal with your sin in your life. It is something that is painful. It is heart-wrenching because it is death to self. But my friend, it is expedient. If we're going to see revival, we must deal with the sin. Dealing with sin is painful. Dealing with sin affects people. I know that's true. And that's why we won't deal with sin. Because we do not want to discomfort people. But friend, I want to say this. Aiken's family was going to be affected by this sin and dealing with this sin. They were going to be affected by it. And I understand tonight that there's going to be people 
They're going to walk away from God. They're going to walk away from the church because we got to deal with sin. But my friend, we cannot ask God. Listen to what I'm saying. We cannot ask God to bless us and we won't deal with our sin. It is painful. It affects people. And it is not popular. It is not popular. I want you to think with me, my friend. We've gotten down to the nitty-gritty the last couple weeks. When you look at church online, it's been nothing but preaching and declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ and men naming sin like we've never seen before This in, or in my lifetime. It is incredible. But it's not popular because there's still a lot of churches out there. They talk about not mentioning sin. Don't talk about sin. Don't call out the sins of the society and generations. But my friend, if we do not let people know what the sin is, if we do not declare what God's holy word says, then people cannot be convicted and they cannot turn to Christ and they cannot get it right. We have got to deal with sin. And I know it's not popular, but God did not calls, uh, call us to be popular. He called us to obey him. And we've got to deal with the sin in our lives. But when we deal with sin, it will humble us. It will bring revival to us. And you say, Brother Joey, what kind of sins? You know, I begin to think about that. And, and, and you can go through all kinds of lists and things. But I think if you go to the Bible, that's the safest place for anybody that, that talks about issues like this. What happened in the Bible? You think in the Word of God, if you go to Corinthians uh, towards uh, right after there in the end of the New Testament, when it, when it starts going to the epistles and talks to the churches, Paul writes to this church at Corinth, and you read through the first, you know, 15 or so chapters of the Corinthians, and you find out this, that he's dealing with problems in the church. He's dealing with sins in the church, and it's like every chapter there's a new sin. Every chapter there's a new issue that Paul's dealing with, and I want you to think some of those sins, and sins that we got to deal with, idolatry. God was second string quarterback for them. He was an option. They were serving him as long as it was comfortable to them. They would serve God as long as it benefited them. But when it cost, listen, them something. They were not willing to pay the price. And Paul addressed it. He said, you got to deal with the idolatry. I want you to think about this too, the dishonesty. Oh man, believers cheating one another. Uh, believers taking other believers to court over minor issues and believers taking money uh, if you can dishonestly taking money from people and, and Paul said my friend this ought not be and dealing with things and just think about it today how many of us who know Christ we're dishonest in our dealings with people. We're dishonest in our, our taxes. We're dishonest in how we live and we're dishonest and think about gossip. He talked about gossip. Do you realize how many Christians over the last couple of weeks have taken the Facebook and spread gossip in the middle? Think of, of, a, of, a, of a national pandemic. We've got people who claim to be Christians, born again, know Christ as their Savior, names are on the roll in heaven, are going to be with Jesus one day who are on Facebook spreading gossip about coronavirus. Are you kidding me? I mean, did, how many times have people in, you, in Barber County, according to Facebook, died from coronavirus? And I want to say, if we're Christians, that ought not be us. We ought not be the ones that are doing that, that are, that are gossiping and being dishonest, especially when other people see it and we have a testimony of Christ. But here's the big one. Don't, don't, don't cut off, okay? Fornication. This is something that is more accepted by the church today than it has ever been accepted before. As a matter of fact, you begin to think why. Why is it that we have pastors who say nothing about divorce? Why is it that we have pastors who say nothing about adultery from the pulpit, who don't address it, who don't call it out for what it is in the Word of God? Why, why is it that we have lost people that come to our church and they're living in fornication, and we never say anything about it. How is it that, that that is where the church of the living God has got to today? And you say, well, preacher, what are you getting? Here's what I'm getting at. we got to deal with it. But we got to deal with it in our lives first. Let me throw this out at you. Stats tell us that 69% of church-going men have a pornography problem. Hold on. But it also tells us that over 50% of pastors have a pornography problem. Now you tell me what that tells you. I'm going to tell you what it tells me. 
it tells me that, that even those who are to be leading the church, the men that God has called, that we are, if you can, we are have strongholds of demonic influences in the spirit of fornication in our lives. And my friend, I want to say that that's why Paul wrote the Corinthian church. He said, listen, this ought not even once be named among you. Deal with it. And if that person won't repent, put them out of the church. Bring it before the church. Say this is sin. It is wrong. Now understand, lost people are going to be lost. Lost people are going to live lost. Lost people have, have no demand on their life to obey Jesus Christ because they don't know Christ. But people that claim to be saved, my friend, adultery is sin. Fornication is sin. And we must call it out. And we've got to deal with that sin. We could go on and on. He talks about pride. Oh, my goodness. Where it's about us. You think of how many people in churches get mad because they didn't sing their favorite song or somebody was looked at them wrong or somebody forgot to shake their hand at church. Are you kidding? And this sin of pride, my friend, is not about us. You don't go to church to be served. You go to church to serve Christ with the body of Christ and you're part of the body. And that is why we do. And Paul says, you deal with this. You're part of the body, all in one. Serve Christ as he has called you and gifted you. But here's the good news. When God came to Joshua, now stay with me, we're almost done. Give me just a couple more minutes and we'll be done. I know you're hungry and uh, <laughs> me too, amen. But think with me just a moment. In our lives, when we begin to go through this and we look at Joshua, God woke him up and God said, Joshua, the problem is sin. You're going to have to deal with this sin. And the Bible said that they dealt with the sin. They brought Achan out and they dealt with Achan. And you know, they stoned Achan and his family and everything that he had. He lost everything that he had. But here's what I want you to get to. Then God sent revival. God sent back revival to his people and they went on. And, and the same battle that was a defeat for them in chapter 7 became a victory for them in chapter number 8. And I just want to go on record and say, my friend... If we want to see victory in the church of the living God, if we want to see churches growing instead of dying, if we want to see God's churches moving forward rather than declining, if we want to see the Word of God going out and being hungered uh, upon by the people in the body of Christ, if we want to see people hungry for preaching and hungry for teaching, my friend, we have got to deal with the sin. God has woken us up. He's wait, he, oh, He's done all He can do. And now we've got to repent. And if we will... God will send revival. And you say, Preacher, what happens if God sends revival? I want to give you these three thoughts. Now, that is short for me. Our people tell you that is a, a fourteen or a 13-minute introduction, and I'm usually three minutes, but stay with me. I want to give you three thoughts about what happened when they dealt with sin. Number one, it removed fear because it brought God back into their life. Go to chapter 8. Would you mind looking chapter number 8 with me? The Bible says in chapter number 8, verse number 1, And the Lord said unto Joshua, watch this, what's those two words? Read it. Fear not. Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. You see, everything had changed now. Why? Because they had God now. They now had God. You see, before God was, if you could, separated from them because their fellowship had been broken through sin. But my friend, when they repented, now they had God back. And they had God with them. And I want to say this, my friend, in your life and in my life, in the life of our church and the life of our church leaderships and the life of us as pastors, fear cannot live in the presence of God. And the reason we're afraid is because we won't deal with our own sin. But when we deal with sin, we have God. And my friend, God brings peace that passes all understanding. And God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. And when we deal with the sin, if you can, it removes fear from our life because we know that God is in control. and We have nothing to fear because He is now in our presence and in our midst. And fear cannot live in God's presence Number one, it removed fear. Number two, it restored aggression among God's people. Will you look down with me in verse number three? Joshua chapter number eight, verse number three. And look what the Bible says. The Bible says, So Joshua rose and all the people of war to go up against Ai. And Joshua chose out, watch this, 30,000 mighty men of valor and sent them away by night. Verse four. 
And he commanded them, saying, Behold, ye shall lie and wait against the city, even behind the city, go not very far from the city, but be ye all ready. And I and all the people that are with me will approach the city, it will come to pass, when they come out against us, that we will flee before them. Hey, for they will come after us, and then you'll come in behind and take over the city. Now what happened? The Bible tells us here that they went out and they got 30,000 men this time and they put a plan in place that they were going to go out and attack Ai and they were going to go against those who brought defeat to them. They were going to go seeking victory. But, but understand what it is showing us here, that they became aggressive. Now, before they weren't that way. Flip back to chapter 7 with me, if you will. Go to chapter 7. I want to show you this. If you don't mind, I just want you to see this. Verse number 3, the Bible says this, And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let two or three thousand men. Look in verse 4. So there went up thither about three thousand men. What happened there? You see in chapter 7, man, they were laid back. They were relaxed. They weren't aggressive. They could care less. They said, I just sent two or three thousand people. We'll be fine. But in chapter number 8, after revival came, what happened? They rallied the troops, my friend. People got up out of their spiritual slumber. People got up off of their, if I can say this, off of their, their, their lazy backside. And they got back involved in, in fighting for God and serving God. And my friend, do you know what revival will do to our churches? It will bring aggression back to the church of the living God where people will begin to use their spiritual gifts for God. People will begin to be a witness for the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. People will begin to encourage other believers in the faith and they'll grow in their faith. But the aggression will come back. Why? Because people are playing games? No, because God is with them. Peace has been restored. They now have God living and abiding among them and the church will go forward in the name of Jesus Christ because revival has come. Think about it. The church today has gotten lazy, my friend. Less than 5% of people are sharing their faith. Ah, oh, Brad Joey, don't bring out the... No, listen. If you're a believer, there's going to be moments. I, I don't, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. That's what walking with Christ is, hearing his voice and following him. Listen, you're a Christian. There's going to be days God puts a person on your heart. You'll go visit that person. You'll share Christ with that person. You'll be standing in line at Piggly Weekly and, and God will speak to you and say, talk to that person about Christ. Give that person a tract from our church. Invite them. Ask them, do they know the Lord is their Savior? God will bring those divine moments of people that he's drawn to himself. But you know the church today, less than 5% of Christians even actively share their faith, according to Barna. And I want to say, my friend, that is called laziness. Most churches, most churches, listen to me, in America, most churches... We don't have enough teachers to fill the Sunday school classes. We don't have enough musicians to play the instruments. We don't have enough people <clears throat> to work in the children's churches. We don't have enough people that are willing to work in nurseries. Why? Because, is it because they're not saved? No, it's because they're in a, a place of, uh, if you can, of withdrawal. They're not aggressively serving God and living for God. Why? Because the revival is not there. But my friend, when revival comes, people get aggressive again. And they get back after serving God. Number one, it removes fear. Number two, it restores aggression among God's people. But number three, and this is the part that has been such a blessing to me. It revives biblical faith into our lives. Now stay with me. It revives biblical faith into our lives. You know, a lot of, and, and, and it's, not, it's not the world's fault. We should never blame the world for what God has given to us because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And I'm telling you, it, it, it's one of my pet peeves is when preachers get up and they begin to blame things on the world. My friend, the world hadn't taken anything that the church hadn't given up. It is our fault and responsibility. But I want you to think with me just a moment. We describe faith many times in churches as a one-time event. You want to be saved? Just call on Jesus. And that settles it. Go back to living your life. Or if you think you need God, just, just look to Him. But listen, in the Bible, the Bible describes faith as an active believing, trusting, looking to Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews put it this way. Looking, actively looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher, the beginning and the end of our faith. In other words, from the day I get saved... Until the day I meet Christ in eternity. My mind is now looking to Christ. My faith is, is consciously abiding in him. As Jesus described it in the Gospels. Abiding in the vine. And I am, I am literally 
looking unto Jesus as my Savior with my mind on Him. And when revival comes, stay with me right here. We begin to go back to living faith on a daily basis. And, and we walk by faith, not by sight. And our whole day, our mind is on Christ, and we notice His little blessings in our life. We notice the answered prayers that He does. We notice the divine appointments and interventions in our lives where God comes in. And all throughout the day, we are noticing God's hand at work in our lives. Why? Because the Bible says, He that believeth, must come to him and believe it that he rewardeth them that diligently seeketh him. I'm sorry. Get that verse right there off the top of my head. But he that comes to God must believe it that he is and that he's rewarded them that diligently seek him. What is That is the idea of a, a person walking with God, walking through tall grass and you're pulling back the grass and you're seeing what's in front of you. You're pulling back the tall grass and seeing what's in front of you. And you're pulling back tall grass and you're seeing what's in front of you. And walking with God is my mind upon Christ looking unto Jesus Christ. Now I want you to follow me here. I want you to go to chapter 7 and I want you to do this with me. If you don't mind, take your finger in chapter number 7, Joshua chapter 7. Put your finger on verse 2 and now I want you to go verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, and verse 5. That's four verses. So in chapter 7, before revival came, before they dealt with their sin, they used four verses to describe their battle with Ai. Now I want you to go to chapter number 8. Starting in verse 1. Verse 1. Verse 2. Verse 3. Verse 4. Verse 5. Hey, skip a few. Verse 15. Verse 18. Skip a few more. Verse 23. Verse 25. Skip a few more. Verse 28. Skip a few more. Verse 30. Skip a few more. Verse 32. Skip a few more. Verse 34, 35. Do you see it? You see in chapter 7 before revival, they use four verses to describe their battle with Ai. Oh, but in chapter 8, when God was with them, when they were no longer fearful because God was with them, when, when God was with them and they were aggressively putting together a plan to go and attack the enemy and move forward together, they gave every detail of the battle. They talked about the plan. They talked about going in. They talked about them following, following them out of town. They talked about them attacking. They talked about the city being going to waste. They talked about everything. Why? Because, my friend, when we walk with God, we begin to notice His hand at work in our life on a daily basis. And you find yourself praising God and thanking God and, and worshiping God and, and being obedient to God. Why? Because you're walking by faith. But understand this, my friend. That only comes when we deal with the sin that is in our life. We've got to deal with the sin that is in our life. Now, I've been going 23 minutes here, and I'm going to wrap it up here. Four minutes was reading at the beginning. But let me ask you this. You said, Preacher, tonight, God has got my attention. I look around what's going on in our world. I look around what's happening right now. I look around what's happening in our church, and, and I look around at everything around me. God has got my attention. And I want to say this. Are you willing to pay the price? Are you? No, I'm pulling no punches. Are you willing to pay the price? Deal with the sin in your life. Maybe a while ago when I was preaching about it, maybe God the Holy Spirit put His finger on a sin in your life. Deal with it. Deal with it. Get it under the blood. Move on. Get victory. If you need help, get help from somebody. Go to your pastor. Get some help. Deal with the sin that is in your life. Deal with it. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, Brother Joy, I'm scared sick. Listen, I'm not telling you that we ought not be afraid of, of, of catching coronavirus. I'm not telling you that we ought not be afraid of, of something because the truth of the matter is we might get it. I might have it. You might have it. We don't know, but I know this. The peace of God rules in our hearts if we are right with Christ. And you don't have to live your life in constant fear in a corner and, 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 and live over in a hole by yourself because you're afraid of life and, and every time something happens you think this is it my life is over listen my friend understand this that we do not live in fear we live with peace and confidence in knowing our God and tonight I want to I wanna close with this we got to deal with the sin in our life and this is for us pastors pray for your pastor 
those churches that are involved in this and your pastors involved in this, pray for your pastor. Because I'm going to tell you, if you think our teenagers deal with peer pressure, you try being a pastor. You try being a pastor. I think it would be good for people, too, that think, think pastoring is an easy job. Go do it. Go try it for a month or two, and, and then you come back and talk to your pastor what it's like to shepherd sheep. You go, you go talk to your pastor about it. But us as pastors, guys, we got to get back to preaching this book. And I want to say this. If the Bible calls it a sin, it's a sin. If the Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong. And my job is to preach it. You see, Brother Joe, if I preach on fornication, people are going to run away. Not if God's drawing them. Because after you preach on the sin, you're going to point to the Savior and say, there he is. Oh, if you'll come to the end of yourself and look to Jesus, you can be saved, you can be forgiven, you can, you can have that sin washed away under the blood and you can know what it's like to have the peace of God in your life. And listen, my friend, we have got to get back to preaching on the sins that are named in the Bible and bring people to Christ, point people to Jesus Christ, let them know. And pastors, we've got to be willing to take up that mantle and preach the word of God as it has been given to us and written to us. And I want to close with this. Maybe you're watching tonight and you say, Preacher, I'm not saved. I know that I'm not. And God has been talking to you about your need for Him and you realize that you are a sinner. You don't just do bad things. You're a bad person at the core. You, you're, you're a drunkard because... You, you get drunk because you're a drunkard. You're in adultery because you're an adulterer at heart. You're a liar all the time because you, are, you lie because you're a liar at heart. You're a sinner. You cannot change yourself. You cannot save yourself. And that is why Jesus Christ came to die for you, my friend. The Bible says, He who knew no sin became sin for us. Why? That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And you can be forgiven. You can have a new life on this earth. But only when you come to the end of yourself and you're willing to turn to Jesus. The Bible says in Romans 10, 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart, God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Confess means to agree with God about who you are in your sin. You're at the end of your sin and self, and you will simply look to Jesus Christ. Think about it. He died for you on a cross and gave his blood so your sin could be forgiven. And then he rose from the dead. He saved himself so that he could save you too. But my friend, you must call on him. You must believe in him. But you I've heard people tell me you can't be saved by calling on Jesus. Listen, for whoso Romans ten thirteen, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Paul said in Ephesians, him that dwelleth in your heart by faith. The moment you look to Jesus, God will come into your life. He'll forgive you, and he will be with you. And my friend, as long as you are believing in Jesus Christ. You're in his hand, my friend, and you're his child. And oh, tonight, won't you call on Jesus right there where you are? You're there tonight, and you say, Brother Joe, I'm not saved. What do I do? I'm going to ask you to bow your head with me right now. Will you call on Jesus? Dear, dear God, forgive me of my sin. Thank you for convicting me. Thank you for your son that died for me and rose from the dead. And he's living right now, speaking to my heart. And God, I ask you to forgive me. Come in my heart and be my Savior. Thank you for loving me, Jesus. I pray in your name. Now you're there and you're a Christian. You say, Preacher, God's talking to me about my sin. Listen to this. First John 1 9 says, If we confess, if I'm willing to pay the price, that painful price, that price that it may affect people, you have to get out of that fornicating relationship. It's going to affect somebody. You have to stop hanging around those friends that you have that keep causing you to backslide into your drinking days. They're going to be mad at you. They're going to tell you you're in a cult. They're going to tell you you've lost your mind. They're going to tell you you don't like them. They're going to gossip. They're probably going to talk about you on Facebook. But I want to ask you a question. Is any of that a bigger price than Jesus paid for us? Is any of that a bigger price tag than you simply having the peace of God in your life? My friend, if we will confess our sin, I know it's painful. 
And I know it affects people. And I know it is not popular, my friend. But I promise you this. You, you get it right with God. And you get around God's people. You get back in church like you need to be when the doors are open. Get on live stream now with your church. Whatever church you're a part of, get there. And I want to say this, my friend. You get back where you need to be for God. And you watch God work in your life. And you will find that the family of God will love you. They're not going to be there to judge you. They know they're sinners too. They know what it's like to sin. They know they're fallen people. They're going to love you and embrace you, my friend. They're going to reach out and embrace you and help you get back on your feet for God. But we have got to deal with the sin that is in our life. And so tonight I'm going to ask you, let's bow our heads together in prayer. And right there as we close, you say, Preacher, i got sin in my life. I need to deal with it. Let's close in prayer. You talk to God, not me. He is your high priest. Father, thank you for loving us. Lord, you know my heart. You know what is between me and you. And God, I pray you deal with it. Remove it. Get it out of my life. Lord, help me to be surrendered to you, obedient to you. God, give me strength. Give me peace and give me confidence, Lord, to deal with the sin in my life and the people in my life that are conducive to that sin. And Lord, I pray that you will help me to grow in my faith. And listen, I want to thank you for taking time to tune in tonight and watch the video and ask you to pray for me and to pray for us. Pray for your pastor. And uh, he's never been through anything like this before, and he is trying, I promise you. He's trying. Pray for him and to continue to share your faith. And, and uh, you let me know if I can ever be of any help. God bless you. And again, Brother Bob, I want to say a special thank you to you for allowing me to be a part uh, tonight. And uh, it's been a blessing. And uh, sure love one another. And, and can't wait till we get out of this quarantine. Amen. And so pray for one another. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in.